Good morning to all of you who have joined us for the Portland Gospel Movement webinar. We're so excited today to gather with Dr. Matthew Sleaf, and we're going to be talking about Sabbath for leaders, especially in this very crazy year that we're experiencing 2020. I can't wait to hear what Dr. Sleaf has to share with us today. Um, but first, I'd love to open us in prayer. So would you bow your heads and focus your heart and pray with me? Father, we come before you this morning and we just want to say thank you for who you are. You are a God who rests. You are a God who orders time. You are a God who's numbered our days. You are a God who is sovereign over all things. Nothing takes you by surprise. And you are present and you are perfect in every way. And so we come before you. We want to just center our hearts and minds on you this morning. We want to invite you into this space of time that we're going to to really learn from one another. We're gonna examine our own hearts and our own adherence to Sabbath, which is a gift that you've given to us. I pray right now, Lord, that your spirit would come, that you would be in every word that's shared, that you would prompt us with great questions to ask, and that you would encourage us. You would encourage us by your word, by Dr. C's experience, um, and by this wonderful gift that you've given to your people, which is a gift of rest. And so we ask that you come now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, I'm so glad that you are here. I want to just kind of share with you about how this time is going to go. Um, we're going to have a session with uh, Dr. Matthew Sleeth, and then we're going to be engaging in some questions. We're going to get an opportunity to ask him some questions. So I want to invite you to use the chat at the bottom of your screen. If, if things come to mind as he's speaking, would you please just write those questions? In fact, right now, you can just get on the chat and introduce yourself. Let us know that you're here. We'd love to be able to to just engage with you as best as possible, to blast through these barriers that Zoom provides and just engage real time as best we can. Uh, then we're gonna have uh, time for questions and we're gonna come back and have another session. And then we're gonna have more opportunity for questions as well. Um, I might be unfamiliar to you, so let me introduce myself. Um, my name is Marianne Nowak. I am a pastor at River West Church. I specialize in ministry to women. And so I, I just love being a part of this great team at River West and also getting to minister to all the women in our, in our church body and our community. I'm also an adjunct professor at Western Seminary where I teach a class in leadership to women. And I am currently a doctoral candidate at Gordon-Conwell back in Boston where I'm studying spiritual formation. And I'm working right now on a thesis project studying the impact of spiritual formation on ministry leaders in the church. So I was delighted to read um, Matthew Slee's book because it's right up the alley of what I'm studying and I'm so eager to apply what he has written to my own project. I'm also joined here by AJ Swoboda and he is a co-panelist with me today. Um, AJ is a, is a pastor and a professor and an author. He's currently um, a professor at Bushnell in Eugene and also at Fuller Seminaries where he actually teaches Bible studies, Christian theology, theology, Bible studies, and Christian history. And um, he is also a lead mentor of a demon program on the Holy Spirit and leadership at Fuller Seminary. He is founder and director of Blessed Earth Northwest, which is a center that thinks creatively and strategically about creation care issues in the Pacific Northwest. He is married and he has um, a, a one son. I forgot to mention too, I'm married. 36 years to my husband, Bob. We have two grown children and three golden retrievers. So that's, that's a little bit about me. And AJ, would you mind introducing Dr. Matthew Sleeth to us today? I'd be absolutely happy to. And thank you for that uh, introduction. And, and it was neglected that I have uh, eight emotionally unstable chickens as well. So I, I forgot to mention <laughs> that as well. Um, yeah, Dr. AJ Swoboda here uh, from Eugene, Oregon. And uh, how do you introduce, uh, how does somebody introduce their hero? Um, <clears throat> Dr. Matthew Sleeth uh, is, uh, for many people uh, who are seeking to follow Jesus in this um, insanely unpredictable and unsustainable way of living that we have called normal, uh, Dr. Matthew Sleeth has paved, uh, uh, paved a way forward for us to think in a different way about what normal means. And um, Dr. Sleeth has a fascinating story. He was a, an, em an emergency room physician. Uh, uh, didn't know God, an emergency room physician, and Jesus encountered him and met him as a, as a doctor. And for the last <clears throat> couple of decades, Dr. Sleeth has given his life to teach Christians 
um, both how to care for the planet, care for the earth. His, his book, Serve God, Save the Planet, is phenomenal. Um, but as well, taught Christians about this biblical principle that we have forgotten. By the way, the one commandment in the Ten Commandments that God said, remember the Sabbath day. And he is reminding us of something we have forgotten, the Sabbath. Uh, Dr. Sleeth and his wife, Nancy, uh, started and <clears throat> run an organization called Blessed Earth, which uh, serves this purpose. Uh, he's an incredible human being, and I had the privilege of uh, serving alongside him for uh, a couple of years and continuing his work in the Pacific Northwest. And so uh, it is my joy to introduce, if you're allowed to be the leading thinker on one of the Ten Commandments, I want to introduce you to Dr. Matthew Sleep. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. And uh, broadcasting, if anybody wants to let me know, uh, that'd be great. Um, so um, uh, it, it's, if we think back to this past December, I don't think any of us that are on this um, could have guessed that in a couple of months, the uh, roads would be deserted on a Monday morning, that um, the stores would be closed, um, that schools would be let out, uh, and, um, and the churches wouldn't be meeting. And so um, I don't know anyone who had that prediction. And so we're all in a place that um, none of us anticipated and none of us planned for. Um, and, uh, and here I am communicating to you in a very different way than I'm used to doing. Um, and... Um, uh, it's it's unusual for me, so you'll have to pardon me if I'm not as animated as I should be, or um, it doesn't feel um, right to you. It feels different to me to be uh, talking in in this manner. Um, I uh, just like the rest of you, kind of uh, got hit by this and 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 didn't know what was coming uh, in 2020. I had a, a little bit of a heads up. In, in that I had a friend who's a missionary uh, who'd been living in Shanghai for three years. And uh, I remember him explaining to me uh, in, in January what an extraordinary thing it was to shut China down uh, during what is their biggest holiday, which is uh, the New Year's time, in which um, uh, you know, something like three quarters of a billion people travel at that time. And so I had a, a little bit of a, a heads up on, on what was coming. Um, and, uh, but I, I didn't really fully appreciate how much it would change my life and how much it would change my family's life and, um, and how much it would change the life of the church. Uh, and I want to share with you what has worked and what hasn't worked for me over this last six months. And more than that, what's worked for me and my family over the last 15 years or so, which is Sabbath. Um, and uh, I want to, uh, because uh, I get to, I'm going to tell you about my grandchildren. Because one of the things that happened along with COVID is that my uh, son and daughter-in-law and my two grandchildren came back from Africa for a break. It was scheduled. It was their first break. Uh, and they were going to be home for six months. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard to describe the joy of a grandparent and, and seeing their grandchild again. And, um, uh, and I have this lovely little three-year-old granddaughter that comes home. Uh, when um, she was not yet born, her parents prayed this prayer that she would have a special relationship with Scripture. And I don't know whether God's making that come true or her parents are making that come true, but she really does have this special relationship with Scripture already. And uh, by the time she was two, she could, uh, she could completely rattle off 1 Corinthians 13 and the 23rd Psalm and the Lord's Prayer and that sort of thing. And so her dad, my son, made a film of her before she turned four, which she did uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, 
sang the 139th Psalm, which isn't a real short one or whatever. And um, she's uh, saying this song and a psalm and along about the time she gets to verse 20, unless you're, and she's not missing a beat, she's just going along and her brother's crying in the background, her little brother's crying, she doesn't miss a beat. And by the time she gets to verse 20, which is they speak against you with malicious intent, your enemies take your name in vain, just to, just to let you know she is a normal kid. She said that whole line with her finger in her nose, um, uh, picking it. So uh, along with this um, saying of the Psalms and everything, they had a set of questions that they asked her. We did this to our kids as they grew up. Uh, every year on their birthday, we'd ask them a set of questions. And it's very interesting to see how things change over the years. They don't remember what they've said from year to year. So you can see what's consistent, what's not consistent with them. And so uh, my, my, this was all filmed and my, my son has uh, her on his, his lap. And he's um, one of the, the first question is, uh, what, what would you do if you had a million dollars? And she thinks for a minute, she said, the things I normally do, I would play. And they kind of clarify it. And he says, that a million dollars is a lot of money. Well, what would you buy? She would buy balloons. How do you make pizza? You make it good, was her answer. Uh, how long does it take to make dinner? Some minutes. Uh, what will your brother be when he grows up? He'll be Luke. So she's not a super genius or anything. What does your daddy do best? He takes care of people. And that's absolutely true. He's the only pediatrician for about 3 million kids where he is in Africa. Um, how about your mom? She takes care of me. What are you afraid of? Cicadas and trains. And then what is the best day of your life? And this is where the story has bearing. What's the best day of your life? Sunday, Sabbath is the best day. And um, one of the other questions was, what is the good deed? And she says, plant trees. So this is definitely my granddaughter. She's already understands about planting trees and she understands about Sabbath, the Lord's day. Um, and, and that brings up and highlights one of the most important points. You and I are probably either, uh, if you're an adult listening to this, you probably are either new to keeping Sabbath or um, you haven't kept it and you maybe want to. Uh, and the real people that can be given Sabbath are the next generation. And uh, as a three-year-old, that's already the special day of her week. It's very interesting. John Wesley uh, asked his mother, how did you raise us the way you did? Because it wasn't just John and Charles. There were all kinds of fabulous siblings in his family. And, um, and so it was, he asked his mother if she could kind of systematically write down what is it that you did that resulted in the family that you have. And, and one of the first things that she notes in that letter, and it's very easy to get online, Susanna Wesley's uh, letter about raising children, uh, is that the children, before they could, quote, walk or well go, knew what the Sabbath was. That was already a special day in their life, meaning before they could, when they were just toddlers, when they were just cruising around on the furniture, banging their heads on the coffee table, that sort of thing. They already knew what Sabbath was. And it would be my prayer that the people listening to this um, are, are invited into the Sabbath and realize the value of it, but even more that they realize that we don't know what's coming for this next generation. We don't know whether stores will be open, closed, whether you know uh, drones will be dropping things out of the sky to us, or we'll be beaming to the grocery store. But if they have a Sabbath in the, their life, they will know that every uh, week that one day is set aside to rest and refresh in the Lord. Um, and so uh, the first question I think we have to ask, and, and I know there's church leaders on this uh, 
um, listening and uh, watching, and I know there's a lot of pastors, and so I'm going to take up a theologic question first, which is, why do we have Sabbath? Why do we, as people on this side of the cross, 2,000 years uh, in time on this side of the cross, we don't celebrate Yom Kippur, we don't celebrate Tish B'Av, uh, uh, we don't celebrate uh, um, Hanukkah, etc. Why? And we don't keep kosher. No one um, who, who's, who's not uh, Jewish keeps kosher. Why do we adhere to this one out of the Ten Commandments? Why? And not just because it's the longest of the commandments in the Bible, not because it's central in the middle of the Ten Commandments, but I guess the question is, why do we adhere to that? I'll go back to John Wesley for a moment. Uh, many of you have probably heard, if you haven't heard of John Wesley, Google him. Um, he's not alive anymore. Um, but uh, most of you probably will have heard of what's called the Wesleyan quadrilateral. Um, it's a way of analyzing and thinking about materials, questions. Uh, if we're being invaded by aliens, what do we do? Well, you can try to analyze it through the Wesleyan quadrilateral. And an acronym for remembering what the quadrilateral was, and he never used this term, it's been applied to him after um, uh, his passing, um, is the acronym REST, um, where R is for reason, E is for experience, S is for scripture, which really should go first, always go to scripture first. And T is tradition. What has been the tradition? And it's, it's very interesting that you can apply this to all kinds of questions and dilemmas and ethical problems that come up, including, I think, COVID-19. If you, you don't have to be a pastor, but if you're just alive in the United States now, people are asking, what do we do about COVID? And, and how should the church respond? And I remember getting an email early on from somebody quoting C.S. Lewis about uh, England being uh, bombed by England and how they should go on and play darts and be in the pubs and live. That was great, but it wasn't very applicable, and it was a kind of a one-channel thinking on things. And if the, the quadrilateral was applied to Sabbath or or, or to, to COVID, um, I think you get to better answers. Um, I haven't systematically done this, but I hope that somebody listening to this does. Um, if you really want to tear that apart, what do you do about COVID and rest and work and that sort of thing? Um, I think you want to go through the Bible from one end to the other and look at the plagues there and how were they used, how were they uh, what were the circumstances of them? Was God working or not working? He certainly was with David and the plagues. He certainly was with Sennacherib uh, and the invasion and the plagues. Uh, Jesus and Matthew described something that can only be like a plague where two people are working and one is taken and the other isn't. And um, two people are drawing water to well, for instance, and one is affected and one is not. Um, his heads up is you never know when I'm coming, and, and none of us know, um, you know, the number of our days. Um, uh, but you could apply that, and you could look at scripture, you could look at the experience. Um, what has been the church's experience with plagues and things like that? There's actually quite a bit written um, throughout the last 2,000 years about hand washing and whether or not the church should wash its hands. And um, we have the experience, actually, of two um, much more recent people, Oliver Wendell Holmes and Aganza Simmelweis. There's actually a term called the Simmelweis reflex, or the Simmelweis uh, condition, uh, which was a widely used term 100 years ago and was bandied about in the church quite a bit. Um, and that comes from Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., um, and, uh, and again, the Semmelweis, they were both physicians. One was in Boston, one was at Vienna Women's Laying In Hospital. And they both simultaneously, about 20 years before the Civil War, realized that purple fever, or it used to be called childbed fever, was greatly diminished 
if um, the, the people delivering the babies, whether that was a nurse midwife or a physician, wash their hands and their instruments between doing an autopsy and delivering a baby. And uh, the death rate fell dramatically, multiple, multiple percentage points. Um, uh, I believe at Vienna Women's uh, Hospital, it fell from in the 20% to 0.2% uh, with this. And, uh, and Holmes had a similar experience in the United States. And the reason I'm bringing this up um, is because Simma Weiss was jailed uh, for this. Um, eventually, ironically, in two weeks' time in jail, he, um, it was a mental institution jail, he uh, died um, of an infection, ironically. Um, and in the United States, Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. was harassed, but he had a standing that was much greater uh, than Simma Weiss's. The Pennsylvania Medical Society revoked Holmes's license to practice medicine in Pennsylvania. It didn't affect him at all. He was really at the head of what was Harvard um, at the time, and he only practiced in Massachusetts and uh, in New Hampshire. And the question would be, why the rejection of this? Why? Um, uh, and the reason was that pastors uh, and other physicians uh, said that Semmelweis and Holmes were not following the Bible. After all, Jesus said we don't have to wash our hands. And so when you take up anything, whether it's COVID or Sabbath or uh, circumstances, um, you know, that each of you are dealing with and getting ethical questions on, a look at scripture and the experience and tradition and then using reason is always a great way uh, to tackle things. So I'm going to going to answer the question of why do we have Sabbath in a, a, a world where Paul writes things like um, one man esteems uh, a particular day over another. In Romans 12, he's writing this. He's writing specifically about Sabbath and that you don't have to keep it. But he does say that everyone should have a firm conviction about it. And most people by default just go with what society thinks. Um, and so if we look at scripture, Sabbath shows up right at the get-go. Uh, it's on the first page of the Bible. Now, the Bible um, obviously hasn't been um, communicated to us in the exact way that it was written. And one of the things that's been changed uh, in scripture is um, the, the verses and the chapters. And I think most often, um, uh, Stephen Langton is, is the one who's either credited or blamed with having put uh, chapter and verse uh, in the Bible. I think it was actually probably Hugo of St. Clair much earlier, in about the year 1200, who, who did this and applied it to the Vulgate. Um, but I don't read Latin, and so I can't go back and look at his correctum uh, which is uh, this treatise on correcting scripture. Um, but uh, either one of them um, uh, tweaked the Bible in a way that I think is harmful to the Sabbath. In Genesis, uh, each day God is creating um, a, a universe and, and out of nothing, and he's, and he's speaking it into existence. And each day he's making something that's more complicated than the day before. And then um, what begins in, in uh, Genesis chapter 2 really should be Genesis 1, because I think the opening um, part of the Bible is a song. I think that for two reasons. One, Tim Keller thinks that. And, and uh, number two, um, you know, there's mention of uh, the angels singing at the beginning of, of everything. And, and so um, I think this probably our opening of our Bible is a song. And that song ends with, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all of his work that he had done. And so God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. That's the, be the 
end of the first creation story. And we see that already um, Sabbath has been invented, as it were, by God. He's made the Sabbath. It says he finishes his work on the seventh day. I think what he does is he makes this, this Sabbath. And he rests on this day. And um, God is holy. And um, God rests. And therefore, rest is holy. It's, uh, in English, it's called a syllogism. And in math, it's called the transitive property. If God rests and God is holy, therefore rest must be holy. And this is the first time we hear the word holy, kadosh, set apart, in, in Scripture. And it's applied to Sabbath. And in the book of Genesis, at least in the Exodus, it's not applied to anything else. It isn't how you behave versus, uh, you know, not stealing or being forgiving or that sort of thing. It's Sabbath. That's the first definition that we have of holy is Sabbath. As you begin going through Scripture, an odd thing happens. Hundreds of years passed, and you know Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and and uh, who who becomes Israel and all of his sons are born, and we never hear a word about Sabbath again. It's a bit of a mystery. And then uh, a, a period of 400 years, uh, this gap exists in Scripture, just like between Malachi and the, and the New Testament. And, and then we meet up with the Hebrew people in Egypt, and they're slaves. Things have changed for them. They didn't expect that either. Uh, they've gone from being a big deal um, with the head of their clan as the grand vizier of, of Egypt to being slaves re reduced and there's this character called the the pharaoh and did you know that in the egyptian language in ancient egypt there isn't a word for freedom it doesn't even exist everyone existed in subjection to the pharaoh the pharaoh was a living god um, and what he he said was, or she, in the case of Hatshepsut, or a couple of the female uh, pharaohs, um, was everything. Um, they were the religion. They were the they were the state, the law, the works. And the pharaoh has um, reduced these people to slavery. And his kind of um, he's kind of a CEO who's just trying to squeeze out the last bit of work. He's paranoid. Um, and he has this kind of thing of work, work, work. And now if you complain, uh, you don't get any straw. It, it reminds me of a T-shirt I saw once. You know, it said something like the pirate ethic, um, which is that the beatings will continue until um, the complaining stops. That, that was his approach to anyone uh, 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 that complained. But of course, God hears the cry of these people. And, um, and, and God answers their prayer, and God frees them with these mighty works and deeds, although the first time the Pharaoh says, ah, God's involved, is, is when the gnats come. You know, it's the tiniest thing um, that, that turns the day there. And, and God leads these people out of bondage um, towards freedom, and before he gives them any of the Ten Commandments, he gives them Sabbath. Uh, and uh, because God has this special place in his heart for the overworked and um, the disenfranchised and the downtrodden. And I'm going to read um, the, the, the Sabbath commandment from Exodus 20. It's the longest commandment in Scripture. Scripture. It is the only commandment which God applies to God specifically. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now this 
Sabbath commandment is repeated uh, at least uh, three full times uh, and partially in, in the Old Testament. It's really, really crucial. It's repeated in, in Deuteronomy 5.11, and there it says, remember you were slaves. It gives, um, uh, in, in the first telling of it, it, God says, remember I created this universe and I'm holy. Um, I think he, God has learned a little bit more about people and how stubborn they are. So by the time we hear it again in Deuteronomy, it's uh, remember that you are slaves. Hey, you, you, you don't want to be slaves again. In Exodus, um, at the end of Exodus, uh, it, the Sabbath commandment is repeated in, in total, really, when Moses is going down from the mountain. It's, it's like uh, God is saying, I'm, I'm blessing you and I'm sending you back to these people. The one thing you got to remember is the Sabbath. Then we see how the Sabbath is kept or not kept uh, as the Old Testament unfolds. And by the time we get to the New Testament, we, we see Jesus um, teaching about all of the commandments. Um, and, and I think you really get a hint of where we can go off the rails. Um, what's wrong with honoring your parents? And yet there's so many games being played about that, that Jesus has to straighten folks out. And I think that the Sabbath has become so perverted um, by the time Jesus comes along, so many onerous laws have been added on that Jesus is teaching, uh, teaching about the real purpose of uh, Sabbath in his ministry. The majority of the miracles that Jesus does and performs are on the Sabbath day. Um, and when we examine those miracles, they, they have something in common. Um, Jesus doesn't walk on water that day. Um, what he does, um, he doesn't feed 5,000. Everything that Jesus does on the Sabbath day, every miracle that he performs is about healing. And uh, it has been my personal experience that the greatest thing I can say about Sabbath is that it's a day of healing. It's a day of wholeness and shalom. Um, Sabbath, the word, and I should probably say it softer, is, um, I, is and the, it escapes me. If somebody can jump back in, uh, AJ, if, if you know, um, that, that, Engl that term for when a word sounds like what it is. And so it's shh. It's about shalom, Sabbath, like Solomon, a man of peace. And so it's supposed to be a time of peace and healing. Um, let me say theologically this one point. As I understand Sabbath, and I know that not everyone who claims Christ um, as Lord and Savior would agree with me on this, but as I understand the theology of uh, the Scripture and the New Testament, Sabbath keeping is not a condition of getting into heaven. It's just the condition that heaven is in when you get there. So we've seen, you know, how Sabbath plays out in Scripture, but why is it that we still have it? Well, every generation of the church um, that I'm aware of has taken up this question of, should we still observe the Sabbath commandment, this side of the cross? And um, it's very interesting that I lived a, a couple of decades in northern New England, and there's many churches up there which are hundreds of years old. And um, what's interesting to me that is that the biggest change in my lifetime is that churches are locked up now. When I was a kid, I never encountered a church anywhere that was locked. When people went on vacations and they had to stop and use a restroom, they'd stop at churches because they were all unlocked. You'd stop at your own denomination. Um, but, uh, and, and so how did locks get on the doors of churches to begin with? Well, in Northern New England, there's writing about this and we kind of know um, churches were open 364 days out of the year, and they put locks on the churches to lock them up for one day out of the year, which was Christmas. They didn't want people celebrating this pagan holiday, which the church sees as, you know, the high holiday, oh, high holy day now. 
remember holiday is holy day. Um, and in and, and church, uh, you know, Christmas is, is the big business for the church now. But um, 150 years ago, 200 years ago, that was the one day out of the year that they locked churches up. But they kept the Sabbath. Um, Sabbath keeping would get you thrown out of a, a Wesleyan ban um, faster than drinking. Uh, and so each generation of the church has taken up whether or not we should observe the Sabbath. Um, it was taken up when the Eastern and Western church uh, split. It was taken up in that Reformation. We have the thoughts of Calvin and Luther and others. And all of them agreed that um, it wasn't uh, per se a point of salvation. It was just essential in being a follower of God. And one of the reasons um, that society was felt to be better because of Sabbath wasn't because of the person who was taking the Sabbath. It was because of the people who are given the Sabbath. And if you'll think back to this, you know, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. That's heads up to the person reading it. But it says, on it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter. Little kids, they have no control over the um, uh, you know, time of their life and what they're doing and when they're doing it. When uh, Hannah was um, asked, how long does it take to make dinner? She said minutes. She, she has no idea. And so for those who, who have no awareness of time yet, um, the, your male and your female servants, those who have no say over when they work and how, um, the sojourner who is within your land, uh, the, the immigrant, that sort of thing, uh, often has to take the, the lowest of the low jobs. Um, and even the beast of the burdens uh, are, are, are mentioned here, meaning God specifically designed these things, it seems, to, to protect the lowest classes and the most disenfranchised and the least powerful in society. So it's, it's interesting um, to me that every generation of the church has understood that, have understood that it was not per se a point of salvation. And yet in my generation, um, Sabbath has become oh, maybe a quirky little thing that you do um, uh, for spiritual growth or something. But it's, it's not a, uh, a fundamental of what the church is for and about. And, um, and so as you think about Sabbath, think not only of keeping it for yourselves, but think that in, in doing Sabbath, in keeping Sabbath, and in honoring Sabbath, eventually the, the most poor and disenfranchised in society are protected. Sabbath doesn't exist anywhere in the world that hasn't got it out of scripture. There's no other society that's ever come up with one day of rest out of seven. It is one of those fingerprints of God on the planet that we sort of take for granted, but nobody else came up with it. The Babylonians had something like it for wealthier people, but they probably got it from the Hebrews. Um, and uh, whenever missionaries come into a new society, one of the most striking things that they brought in the past was Sabbath. And um, if you've ever read any of the missionary journals, um, uh, there's a lovely one, How I Know That God Answers Prayer by a, a woman who was a missionary in uh, China in the 1890s. Um, uh, and you just read about these. One of the things that was hardest for people to get their head around, even more than God, was the fact that God would allow everyone to stop one day out of the week. And so it's, um, um, it's my hope that, that you um, who are in the church, who believe in God, would believe in his rest. Um, everything about the Sabbath is counterintuitive. And everything in the world wants to take it away from you. Uh, there is no government institution for Sabbath. There's no academic institution for Sabbath. The, the seminaries don't really teach it even. The academics that are just interested in theology um, don't really adhere much to it. Um, and so 
everybody, everything, and everyone wants to take Sabbath away from you. And it's counterintuitive. But I want to tell just a little anecdote, a little story that I think represents how you should think about Sabbath. When my kids were little um, and I was just out of residency, I, I worked in emergency medicine, my career in uh, medicine, and we lived in Mount Pelier, Vermont. It's a beautiful little town and it's tiny. It's the smallest capital in the United States. And, um, and uh, Mount Pelier is very, very small because the weather is just phenomenally bad there. It's in the middle of the mountains and it snows, snow, snow. And the first year that I lived in Northern New England with my kids, by the time that January had come, we'd already had 12 feet of snow in Mount Pelier. And uh, um, fires are a really big thing. Um, having a fire, having a wood stove, that sort of thing, it's big. And uh, so we would have a fire. And my wife one morning said, you know, the, the wood pile's getting low. You need to um, actually, and, and we had a wood pile in the basement, and then we had a wood pile outside. She said, the wood pile's low inside the house. You need to bring transfer wood inside. And she said, why don't you take Clark along with you? Well, anybody who's ever had a, a little kid, um, he was three years old at that time, knows that getting a kid into a snowsuit, you know, it's, it's like uh, suiting up a mercury era astronaut or whatever it just takes a long time so i got him all in his snowsuit and everything and we went down through the basement and our house was built on a hill like this um you come in one level you go out uh, uh, a story and a half lower um at the at the other side of the house and uh, and there was a level area there that had the firewood stacked on it and they told clark to stay there because that that was about 20 feet and then you hit an area that sloped off and then it kind of hit a cliff and you could fall 20 feet. My kids were really good. They, they always uh, listened about safety things and he stayed right close to me where he was supposed to, but something had happened that I didn't realize. And that was that the day before uh, it had gotten warm enough to melt the top of the snow and uh, it had turned to ice. And while he was still on the, almost level ground, um, he got on top of that ice and he did not have enough mass or weight to kind of punch through it. And he starts sliding down the hill towards the steep incline and the cliff. And, um, and he'd fall down and he'd struggle and struggle and struggle. And, he'd, and in that struggling, he'd go sliding down the hill. When he fell and he was laying flat, he had enough friction to just stay there. But, you know, he knew the cliff was behind him and everything. And in that panic, um, he just wanted to struggle as hard as he could to get up to me. I wasn't going to be able to get to him in time. And I screamed to him the only thing that could save him, which was to stop. And he did. He was laying there flat. And I ran down and I grabbed him. I still remember his little blue hood on his jacket and pulled him up to safety. Now, he, every, every sinew in his body, every cell in his brain said to struggle to get back up the hill. But his father, who had never lied to him, told him to stop. And if you could do that, if you... If, if every cell in your body says, I need to work more, I need to catch up or get ahead or whatever, and if you could remember that your father, who has never lied to you, says stop, um, that I, I will have done my, my, my part here. And in that trust and in that obedience, um, you're going to find rest. If you go to Hebrews 4 and you read chapter 3, which is about... Um, the Hebrew people not listening to God and not being able to enter into the land. And it goes on to describe that Christ is our rest now. But belief is what allows you to enter into that rest. And I think a lot of the times when we don't do Sabbath, it's because we don't really believe God's there. And we don't really believe that he's going to catch us. Um, and it's been my experience that he wants you to test him on this one, um, that when you stop, when you incorporate Sabbath into your life, um, 
uh, that you find out that God's there. Otherwise, you don't know. <laughs> Sometimes you're doing everything. Um, and so it's been my experience um, that, that it is uh, very much a reassuring activity that lets you know that God's there, that he's going to give you enough manna on day six to make it through day seven, um, and, and that this is going to be a very healthy experience for you, both spiritually, economically, physically, every way you look at it. Um, it's um, been pretty well documented that people who keep a regular Sabbath live a fair bit longer um, than those who don't. Uh, in the book, The Blue Zone, this is described in the United States, the cohort that lives the longest, that regularly lives into uh, the hundreds, uh, is in Loma Linda, California. It's the home of the Seventh-day at Venice. And, uh, uh, and they live longer. But I got to tell you that uh, I've been to Andrews University and some of the other flagship uh, uh, Seventh-day Adventist uh, universities to talk about Sabbath. By the time they're asking me in, a, a non-Adventist, uh, you know that Sabbath is in trouble even there. Remember I said every everything wants to take uh, Sabbath away. And actually, I'll make that a little bit more personal. There's only one person in the Bible who introduces himself to God as busy. And um, uh, you probably never had this pointed out, but he introduces himself to God as busy. It's in the book of Job, and it's Satan. And God says, where have you been? It's clear he's late to the meeting <laughs> or the gathering. And he says, I've been going to and fro and up and down on the earth. And that's the poetry that uh, Job was written in, um, that, uh, um, that I'm busy, because Satan is not omnipotent and omniscient. Um, he, and Satan wants to conform us into his image, and um, God wants us to conform a, us into the image of Christ, who is a man of peace. Um, and when we take his yoke upon us, and to me, his yoke is uh, keeping one day of rest, um, then that peace uh, settles on us. I think I'm going to stop here because it's so weird. I've only seen myself on this screen, and I want to see another live human and know that I'm not just talking to myself. So Mary Ann and AJ can come back and join me. And in the second half of this, I'll get into some specifics of how I keep the Sabbath, or maybe it'll come up with some questions. Oh, it's nice to see uh, living faces again. Thank you so much. That was so thought-provoking. There's a couple things that you said that really um, stirred up my thinking, especially uh, just talking about the day of Sabbath as healing. And it struck me how God puts us to sleep every 24 hours, right? We sleep and we, our bodies rest and are rejuvenated and how logical it would be that every seven days we would rest and we would, we would experience healing and peace. Um, but I have a question. Something that you said also really provoked my thinking. And you said that, um, you said that, that the poor and disenfranchised in society are protected when God's people practice Sabbath. And um, I just wonder if you could uh, explain a little bit more about that. That's a really... It's a really thought-provoking statement. I'd love to know what. How do you see them being protected? What What is the ripple effects of God's people in society practicing Sabbath on society at large? Well, if um, you you know you don't have uh, stores open, uh, you you don't have somebody that has to mop the floors in those stores and 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 man them and that sort of thing. It was very interesting. I was in AJ's uh, church. Uh, Theophilus in um, Portland, wonderful church, and somebody asked a question. And they said, you know, how can I take Sabbath when there's poor people who can't take it? Because egalitarianism has been um, elevated to the level of religion um, in, in society, and it's not scriptural or anything. Um, and so, but it's, it's motivated by good thoughts or whatever. And so this person asked it and, uh, you know, I could have gone through a long involved um, kind of explanation, but somebody raised their hand and uh, AJ, I don't know if you remember this and said, let me answer that. I'm first generation to this country. I grew up in LA. Um, 
and I worked in a balloon factory with my parents until I was seven, I think he said, every day of the week, Sundays included. And then my parents went to church for the first time. And then I didn't work as a seven-year-old seven days a week. He could have been nine. It was nine or seven. I don't know. Do you remember, AJ? I don't remember how old he was, but I remember the question. Yeah. And so um, as we, you know, uh, begin to value time with the Lord, we tend to make room for the things that we value uh, in, in life. And um, uh, it, it, the, you know, I, I think in animist societies, um, my, my, my children are full-time missionaries or medical missionaries in, uh, in uh, Africa. And, and, and they just see where when a society begins to value the Lord, they begin to have church and make time and, and a place um, uh, for, the, for the Lord in their lives. And that's how they're protected. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, thank you. Um, Good question. Thank you. Uh, Oh, my dad uh, had businesses and he always was closed on Sunday. And so we did grow up with the Sabbath and just what you said is true. All of those employees were released to have um, a day of just enjoying. So, um, so thank you for that. AJ, I know you've got a lot of questions you'd like to ask as well. I do. And one of my favorite things about Matthew is he, he likes actually difficult questions. So I, I think I'm going to give you one Matthew, if that's okay. Um, I really, uh, your, your work on Genesis 1 uh, really shaped my understanding of the role of Sabbath. I mean, it's, you know, you pointed out to me years ago that God invites Adam and Eve to Sabbath way before he tells anybody to not murder anybody. So it's like, it's like so, it's so critical to human life and, and creation. And uh, when you look at all the days of creation, right? Day one, day two, that if, if we were to remove any of the days of creation, like if we removed water from creation, um, we couldn't exist. If we remove uh, green things from creation, we couldn't, we couldn't breathe. If we removed light, we would die almost instantaneous. Yet we think we can remove the seventh day, the Sabbath, and be just fine, and creation will be just okay. I guess my question is this, Matthew, and, and again, this is theological, but you're a doctor, and, and I think there's not many people who can answer this as well as you. Um, do you think in some way, shape, or form, the fact that we have essentially uh, cut out Sabbath from the created realm, that it's actually causing uh, our bodies and our earth to, to fragment and die? I mean, are we, are we seeing, I mean, even with the virus, are we seeing creation kind of tell us, go into your room and think about what you've done for a while? That's a very interesting question. I, I think that um, when we throw, and let's face it, when you throw Sabbath out of your life, you're throwing God out. They, they tend to go hand in hand, I think. Um, and uh, when we throw, so I have to answer that as when we throw Sabbath and God <laughs> out. Um, uh, by, by and large, um, things begin to unwind and to go badly. Um, and, uh, I think that, you know, that our health fails, um, with that, our, our, our physical bodies fail. Um, uh, it, we live, um, a fairly long time, but not significantly longer than in a generation ago. And yet it costs us a gazillion dollars to get there. Um, and, um, I, you know, I've written about this on the amount of money it takes for us to get the lifespan that we have, which isn't actually all that ex extraordinary. And that amount of money is increasing and increasing and increasing. Um, and, and I think part of that is throwing God um, and uh, the Sabbath out of our lives. Um, I just, uh, when we get to talking about how do you handle Sabbath in a COVID world and everything, uh, one of the things I did um, was uh, uh, to, to have this talk with my wife about what are we going to do? This is going to be a marathon, not a sprint. And, and we had this talk in February. Um, how do we handle what I said was going to be 18 months at least? 
um, of a very, very different um, life. Um, and one of the things I said is, um, it, it, my, all of my speaking engagements were canceled. Um, uh, and I'm booked up for usually a year or so in advance. They were all canceled. And so I, I need to think about how am I gonna redeem these hours and everything. And one of the things I did was to write a book, which fortunately I had a contract with Tyndale for, um, and it's about suicide. And um, right now we have an epidemic of depression and suicide and drug overdoses going on in this country. And I believe that they are very much related to tossing God and the Sabbath out, um, that there's a correlation between those. Um, between um, intentional suicide and ambivalent suicide, which is what I call drug overdoses that result in death, um, we're keeping pace almost with COVID deaths. It's just that it's not news. <laughs> um, it, something is very wrong. And I think the church has to get itself healthy in order to answer uh, this need, whether it's the lack of rest or, or whether it's this hopelessness and this despair that's washing uh, across us now. Um, I think when people see me in church, they see somebody who's happy and not just because I got a fake smile plastered on. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? And I, and I think that when they look at us and they see that, you know, that fruit of the Holy Spirit, which the, you know, the kind of the second component of that is joy, um, that, that, that people re will respond to that. And I say, hey, it comes from Sabbath. Um, and I'm trying to say that it's multi-generational in my family now. Now is when we graft ourselves into this tree, you know, called Christ and, um, and we rest and that sort of thing. Uh, so the answer, the long, that's a long answer to your question, AJ, that, um, that I think that not only does, um, us, do we suffer as human beings, as individuals, but all of the planet does and the environment does. Because if you look at all the laws about taking care of the planet in the Old Testament, they all fall out under what's called the sabbatical laws. So God tied the two together. And, and so I think, um, you know, that absolutely there's a connection between. Yeah. And uh, Matthew, we have a from one of our panelists. Uh, Bill McLeod, there is a relationship between Sabbath and fasting. It's, um, that is an interesting question. Of all the spiritual disciplines that I know the least about, fasting is at the top. <laughs> uh, partly because I've come out of emergency medicine and you can, and it is the most disruptive uh, schedule. You can't pick a day to fast when you need to focus on saving other people's uh, lives. So it just isn't something I, I've I've made a promise to the people I talk to that I will not answer something I don't know the answer uh, to. And so they picked one. But having said that, one of the um, plans that I made for this. Um, COVID time was, uh, I got to get in better shape. You know, if God wants to use me and use me for a long time. You got So I'm 17 pounds lighter than I was at the beginning of this uh, uh, pandemic. So I know a little bit about being hungry. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but connecting Sabbath and fasting doesn't naturally go together for me because to me, Sabbath is a time of joy and relaxation and, um, of plenty, if you will. Sabbath represents a feast uh, to me. Now, having said that, it also represents a change. So if somebody works and, you, you know, here, I, here is my, here's my workshop, books, books, more books. I started life as a carpenter. I worked physically, you know, for seven years before I went to undergraduate school. And uh, the last thing I would want to do on a day of rest was physical exercise. Um, and Sabbath is about a change. So m many of us are tied to desks like this, and Sabbath may very well be about a very long walk or a bike ride or, or, or some, 
something like that. What I'm leaning to is most of us stuff our faces all we want six days out of the week, we overeat. So perhaps for that person fasting on that day uh, is that change that, that, that kind of gets them out of the rut and they become more thankful for the food, et cetera. But I'm just winging it in, yeah. in connecting those there. Those are good, great thoughts. AJ, should we move on to the next session, do you think? Or do you have another question? I have one last question if possible. Um, Matthew, um, you're, if you're speaking to a bunch of pastors in the room, there's no doubt that pastors in this, in this conversation have congregants that might have reasons um, to not Sabbath and theological reasons. Um, can I just ask you the number one question I get and then, and then get your response? Um, I, this is the number one response that I get from people that are hostile to the idea of the Sabbath, that if I keep the Sabbath, this is just me returning to kind of a Judaic legalism. Um, this is just, it's just Old Testament law and we don't have to worry about it anymore. I'm sure you've responded to that a thousand times. How do you respond to that question? Well, that was kind of the, why do we have it a uh, whole section I did here? Cause I know that there's a lot of pastors on this. Um, you know, how has the church said we're free from that law, but Oh, we got it. You know, it's just like, it's not, as Paul says, I can do anything I want, but not everything is good for me. Um, and, and, um, uh, if you, if you think that it's legalism, don't do it. Uh, don't, don't do it. But, um, you're, you're saying, I don't want to do it. And you haven't had experience with it. I would say maybe the better thing to do is to try it for six months and then tell me what you think. Um, uh, it's, it's worth that much of an experiment. I think, uh, uh, six months, what is that, 25 days uh, that you, you try uh, um, Sabbath on. It's very interesting. I, I have on my desk here, uh, uh, I print them out, the letters that people send me. I've, I have gotten so many letters in the last six months, year really, that a, a big portion of what I'm doing now is sitting and writing return letters to people, particularly the non-Christians who write to me with, with uh, um questions and everything. And I get all kinds of questions and comments and that sort of thing. I have never gotten the letter. I am really mad at you that you made me take up Sabbath. I've never gotten one of those. And I've been teaching about this for 15 years. And I've never gotten a, this, this ruined my marriage, this, you know, caused my health to go downhill. It's always the opposite. So this one, if somebody says that, you can say, fine, you don't have to try it. But I, I would say maybe I ought to try it and then tell me how it works out for you and speak from experience rather than from, from up here. Yeah. You know, when we put on our theologian hats, we tell people what we've read. When we put on our saints hats, we tell people what we've seen. Mm -hmm. and, and I think to those people, they ought to see what the Sabbath does in their life. Yeah. <clears throat> So much. We're excited now to hear more from you. So um, AJ and I are going to jump off and, and let you take the floor. Thank you, Matthew. Okay. Well, you know, when you jump off, all I'm doing is looking at a blank screen and myself. On it, and it's like the last thing I want to look at. But anyway, so um, I, I recall the first time I was on a, a television show, I was on uh, Sanjay Gupta, you know, he's a TV doctor. And, uh, and we went, I went from talking to then I was actually on the show and there was a blank screen and I just froze. <laughs> so I haven't been invited back. But anyways, <laughs> I'll pretend like you're there. Um, so let me, let me pick this up with um, how we started um, uh, Sabbath as a, a family and then specifically what we've decided to do here in this COVID uh, time of life. Um, I started it right at the beginning of my Christian experience as, and, and for me, I, I don't have one day that I can tell you that I was a Christian and one day that I, I was not. Um, for me, my experience was not Paul's of being, you know, knocked on the ground on the road to Damascus, but Peter's of, I'm with you. Uh, I never knew you. <laughs> I'm with you. I never heard of the guy. Um, and that was my experience uh, in coming into Christianity. But as Billy Graham uh, used to say, 
uh, you know, there comes a time when you know that you know that you know. Um, but very early on, we instituted uh, Sabbath keeping in our home before my wife was a Christian, before my son and, and daughter were. And um, that necessitated them, my children, getting all the housework and the homework done um, by Saturday evening. And, um, and they learned that ha habit because Sabbath keeping isn't just organizing your time of rest, it's organizing your time of work. And we see that in the Old Testament in that you have to work twice as much the day before to pick up the manna so that you do have um, a day of rest. And so my, my children really learned how to um, organize themselves. Um, and it kind of made it fun on Saturdays. I remember my son and I would, we, we learned that it was way faster to vacuum the house if one person was operating, you know, the front end and another person was carrying the vacuum. And, and we, we thought that it should be an Olympic sport, actually, next to snow shoveling and raking. You can tell this is real New England stuff. Um, and, and so we would, we would get that housework done and, and my kids would get that homework done. Um, and then we saw what the experiment was like. It's, it's been a long experiment to see how my children turned out. Uh, and I remember in high school, they went to an extremely competitive high school, St. Johnsbury Academy. Um, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a high school with separate buildings for the art department and the science department and everything. And, um, and one of the teachers said, you know, your, your kids aren't going to make it. Um, if they if they can't do homework on Sunday, they're just they're not gonna. This is not the way this school operates. And my daughter would get up every day at four o'clock to study before school. It's very rigorous, um, you know, kind of school. Um, and uh, the the to run the the you know the fast forward through this how the experiment turned out. My son was a Val Victorian at his high school. My daughter didn't graduate from high school. She was accepted to um, uh, college early because she only missed two questions on her SATs. Um, and they both graduated uh, first in in college. Um, and my son did it in three years, and then he graduated first in his med school class. They're smart kids. They got a Jewish mom. You know, they know how to study. But there's lots of smart kids. There's lots of kids with Jewish moms. What they had in retrospect was something no other kid had. They had a day every week of rest. They had a day when God loved them for being human beings, not human doings. And their parents loved them for being human beings and not human doings. Um, so we, we started Sabbath early on. It's very interesting. This morning, I met my son and we walked um, at, on his six months back here in the U.S. He's been running a COVID team at the university hospital, but he's come, he's just stopped that because he's going to go back to Kenya. So we can finally kind of reintegrate um, together. We've been walking every morning. And I said, you know, I'm going to be doing this today. Tell me about your Sabbath experience. He said, Dad, you know, when I get back to Tenwick Hospital, he's the only pediatrician for 2 million kids. Um, and it's a big hospital. They have like this daily census of 600 or so. Um, and he said, it's really difficult. When I take a day off, somebody's going to die. He says, it's just a fact of life. You know, I, I, I'm not going to be there. Somebody's going to die. And he said, you know, when it gets moved around, and he said, but in general, I take four days a month in which I don't see patients. And because of that, he can stay there. He can stay on the field. He can stay on the front lines. Um, he can keep teaching, you know, new interns how to take care of these babies and everything. And, um, and so I, th I think a lot of people say, well, you know, if I don't do it or I, I'm the minister or whatever, it's not going to get done. Little kids die when he doesn't go to work. And that's the way it's got to be because he goes to work and he's going to be able and he's been doing it for years now. Um, and so I think that's the most extreme case. And he doesn't have an excuse. He he has a refreshment in in Sabbath. So we 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 started this early. Um, 
organization is important. It's about getting the work done and then laying it down. Um, and then what do you do on Sabbath? Um, I can't tell you what to do. I, I think a lot of us are going crazy to go back to church. You know, I, I'd love to be there. Um, I can't go to church. My church is closed now. Um, but what I use is the Philippians 4-8 model of what to put into my head on the Sabbath. It's a time that I feel particularly close to God. And so, and, and I don't have to turn to Philippians 4-8. This is one that made it to the front of my Bible. Um, and it says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatsoever things are honest or honorable, just, pure, lovely, of good report or commendable, if there's any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. And so on my Sabbath, I, whether I'm looking at art or whether I'm listening to music or whether I'm reading, on those days in particular, I want to make sure that things that are of good report are in my focus. So at the beginning of this um, COVID um, pandemic in, in the U.S., it was uh, end of February, uh, my wife and I went on a walk and I said, it's going to be a marathon. It's going to be at least 18 months. And uh, let's figure out how to redeem this time. I'm not going to be able to do my regular work, um, but I'm, uh, this is what I'm going to work on writing-wise. Um, we, we talked about how should we do prayer during that time. Um, what should we do physically to stay fit? And as I shared earlier, that has, for me, uh, meant uh, being hungry a lot. And, but I've lost 17 pounds, and I feel better. Um, how are we going to stay in touch with family? How are we going to increase our faith? And one of the things I decided to really kind of double down on is old-fashioned letter writing. Um, there's something about touch, human touch. When I was a physician, one of the duties that I had was to touch people. And I remember particularly folks coming in from nursing homes who may have lost their spouse a decade before, see their children infrequently or whatever. And the moment I'd start talking to them, I'd just hold their hand. And, 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 and touch is, is very important to us. And there's something very tactile about getting a letter. <laughs> and, and so I've been writing letters on, on Sabbath. Um, the letters to non-Christians I tend to not do on a Sabbath because it's more work. It takes me 10 times as long to write a letter to a non-believer. Um, because I want, I can't use shorthand. I can't break into biblish. I can't, you know, um, I can't be sloppy uh, about it. Um, but one of the things that I found invaluable in the beginning of my Christian walk uh, was to change my attitude about gratitude, as it were. Um, coming from a, a background without family and having worked really hard, I didn't have the best, uh, you know, I kind of thought everything that I had, I'd given myself. Um, and I had a cynical attitude, if you will, um, that can happen working emergency medicine. Uh, and somehow I came on this idea of every day writing down uh, something that I was grateful for. And then on my Sabbath, just looking back over those six items, it can be one, as, as little as one word. It can be a film of something or whatever. And first of all, that'll change your whole mindset. Just, it might sound simple. It might sound childlike while I was doing it. Just do it. It's one of those experiment with it and see what happens to you. Uh, because what you will find, or what I found, was that over time, my gratitude journal morphed into a miracle journal. And what I was given were the eyes to see God at work, and everything that God does is a miracle. And, and, and so I 
develop the ability to see that. It all came through Sabbath, for, through stopping that one day to look back on the, um, the six days before, just like God does in, in, in Genesis 2.1, um, and to look back and to say it's good or it's very good. And, um, and then what you get to is it's not good and it's not very good, it's holy. You get to see the Lord at work. Um, and so that, that's one I would just absolutely uh, recommend uh, at the top of the list of a, a Sabbath activity. Um, Sabbath with little kids is different. Uh, we just had our granddaughter here uh, this morning, and we had our granddaughter and our grandson here uh, all day yesterday. It's exhausting um, to have little kids. There's a reason that young people have children and not grandparents. Um, but my, my granddaughter already looks forward to Sunday. It's a day where she's allowed to eat a couple special foods. She's allowed to watch the magic school bus only on that day. And no other day does she watch any kind of video or screen kind of thing. And so there's, you know, there's, um, for, for children, they should be given simple things. Uh, something that AJ uh, talks about, and I think he did, and he wrote a, a wonderful book on this uh, called Subversive Sabbath. Um, is that uh, little Jewish kids uh, eons ago were given a teaspoon of honey uh, every Sabbath. Honey is the only sweet thing, really, where um, sugar is very concentrated um, to remind them of how sweet the Sabbath is. So I recommend AJ's book uh, to you. Um, and, uh, and so you try to punctuate it for the children that it, that it is a day that's special, that's set aside. It's more joyful than other days, uh, frankly. Um, I've got a, uh, we have uh, Blessed Earth has a website uh, called sabbathliving.org. There's sermons on there if you, uh, about Sabbath, if you don't want to write your own and, and give them. Um, but there's a film of the Mara family, and uh, one of the, the Mara children, I think it's Peter uh, Mara, uh, just said, I don't have to make my bed on Sunday. Oh, what a relief <laughs> it is. The problem is if your kid doesn't have to make the bed any day out of the week, then there's nothing special. So remember that Sabbath isn't just about rest. It's about organizing work on the other uh, six days. Um, I think I'll let um, uh, my my lovely uh, friends uh, come back on and 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 ask more questions at this point, if that's okay. Yes. AJ, yeah, is that in your book about the? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, and, okay. and 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 interestingly, um, uh, uh, the the in our family we don't we don't do honey we do pancakes and what we found is that. Uh, that it really works well because in almost Pavlo Pavlovian style, my son's body uh, yearns for pancakes every Sabbath. And so he, we're manipulating his body now to need the Sabbath. And we're, we're finding that it's working quite well. Very good. Very good. Marianne, yeah. question? Yeah, I was just reflecting joyfully on the things you shared because um, I grew up with a strict uh, kind of Sabbath routine. We went to church. But for as a kid, um, we were to be uh, seen but not heard. We were to be quiet in our rooms on Sabbath. And my parents kind of had their time to relax and enjoy a day of rest, really rest. So I really love what you're talking about as far as um, I love the Philippians 4.8. But I also love like the joy, the freedom, the festivity, the gratitude, the choosing activities that are life-giving. Like, that ignites in me uh, uh, just a, a real desire to embrace a day as a gift from God to enjoy shalom. Um, can you expand, like, can you just throw out some other ideas? I love the ideas you shared that are ways to enjoy Sabbath. Well, what, uh, before I do that, I'm going to gonna touch on something there with your parents. Um, one of the things when I come to a church and I'm teaching about Sabbath that I always do is walk through the other nine of the commandments. And, and I point how they're in two groups. There's the first three commandments about God and how we're to understand him. And then commandments five through 10, um, honor your parents, don't kill, lie, cheat, steal, run around or put stuff on your credit card to keep up with your neighbors. Um, uh, those commandments don't have anything to do with God. They're about civilization and, and that sort of thing. And then I ask people to remember their best memories from Sunday 
as a kid growing up, if they grew up in the church and they'll remember going to church and uh, then they'll remember family meals and that sort of thing. And they remember being made to take naps. <laughs> yeah. And so I'll point out that almost, it, were you uh, made to take naps by the way? No, I was just, uh, no, no friends could come over. It was just go. Okay. Rooms well, a lot, lot of kids are made to take naps. And then I'll say, you know, it, when you, you, you invariably got up and went into your parents' door and it was locked, your parents were not committing adultery. And, and, and when you walk through what happens on a Sunday, you're really walking through the Ten Commandments. We went to church, Commandment 1, 2, and 3. If you think of Judaism as how far away you can get from God before you get out of bounds and Christianity is how close you can get to God, um, then... <laughs> Uh, you know, when the commandment says, don't do this, God is really trying to get you to do the opposite. It's, it's don't, you know, don't take my, my name in vain. Well, the opposite of it is to call on the Lord in reverence and prayer and worship. That's what you're doing in church. And, and so, you know, re, um, and, and then in those commandments, you know, uh, uh, you know, honor your parents. There's, there's nothing that honors me like having my family around a table together. And that's everybody's memories of Sabbath when they grew up. Um, and so I walk through how all the commandments are easier. And then I'll, uh, I'll thou shalt not commit adultery. How about that one, Dr. Sleuth? Well, that's the door that's locked. Um, and, and, and so, um, and it's very interesting if you look at um, uh, Puritan sermons on Sabbath, uh, they would exhort people to go home and lock the door. This was a New England invention again and, and make babies and that sort of thing. Um, and it's very interesting that, you know, we're, we're told that 50% of marriages will end in divorce. And I don't think there's one in 10,000 uh, marriage counselors, and really it's divorce counseling, if you don't ask, ask this question is, what are y'all doing for Sabbath? Uh, I think there's a absolute direct link between, between not having Sabbath in a home and, and divorce. Um, and, and so it, it should be a thing of joy. Um, and, and, and it should be something that you're looking forward to six days out of the week. And I have to tell you that the benefits of Sabbath, you're not going to see in the first month and you're not going to see in the first few months. It's, it's years into it that you wouldn't let go of it for anything on this earth, literally. I wouldn't. Um, that you really begin to see the, the benefits of it. It's, think of it as spiritual exercise and you're buff once you've kept <laughs> spiritually buff once you've kept Sabbath for six months or, or so. And I'm a Sabbath marathoner, you know, having done it for coming up on two decades here, I've been a Christian. Um, so don't expect to see all the benefits at once. But if you are not somewhat sad on Sunday evening, if your Sabbath is on Sunday, and by the way, for pastors, you're going to have to move it uh, to Friday or Monday or something like that, but encourage your church to do it on Sunday because Sabbath keeping, I think the reason we didn't hear from it from Genesis all the way to Exodus is because God was building a community. And um, it's, it's been my experience and I've worked with a lot of churches and some churches are very good about this and some are lousy, but a church that actually begins the Sabbath together is a very functional church. Um, and, and, and also in my experience, pastors who have kept a Sabbath joyfully are infinitely better equipped to go the long haul and ministry is going to get harder as time goes by. It's not going to get easier. It's going to get harder. Um, and so you want to prepare yourself. You want to get plugged into the grid of joy as it were. And, and for me, that that's Sabbath. Awesome. Thank you. AJ? Marianne, yeah, I've got a great question for you, Matthew, and thank you for addressing the question of the day of the week, because I know for a lot of pastors, uh, if we're going to say it has to be Sunday or something to that effect, um, that affects a pastor's life and, and how they 
you know, how, how do they, I, I want to ask a question about technology, Matthew. Um, as you think about the Sabbath and the fact that we now have our work in our phones everywhere, our work in our pockets everywhere we go, um, how, how does the Sabbath actually speak to our, our relationship to our technology? How does it actually shape um, what we do with our phones, what we do with our computers, what we do with our TVs? Yeah, I, I heard this guy talking about the uh, Sabbath once, and he, he held up a phone, and he said, this, this is what you need to do with your phone on the Sabbath. And he squeezed these two buttons, and he shut it down completely. That was AJ. And uh, I, I think that the concept of screenless Sabbath is the way to go. For one thing, uh, particularly during uh, this time of, of uncertainty, um, people can get addicted to checking and rechecking the same news, and that's really bad for you. Just, I don't think, unless you're involved in the news industry, that you need to spend any more than 30 minutes a day on gathering news. Um, and I don't think you need to do it on on Sunday. If the world comes to an end, somebody will let you know. Um, and I think that actually makes you a more effective and engaged person over time, as opposed to being bogged down with anxiety and worry. And so, um, uh, so I think screenless uh, Sundays are a really great way to go. Um, we get a ton of email. My wife cannot not answer email if there's a computer open. So she really just has to close the computer uh, for that day. I'm not as um, computer uh, integrated as many people. I'm like an old fashioned Luddite or whatever. Um, so I might open up the computer, but usually I don't. I don't take computers with me when I travel or anything. Um, I, I really think that you, you've got to give it up. He, here's uh, something for people to try. Try putting your, uh, your phone to sleep uh, or in closing off your computer for 24 hours. If you're uncomfortable, there's a problem. You, some, you know the addictive potential of something, um, not by necessarily how it makes you feel while you're doing it, but by how it makes you feel when you stop. So for instance, cigarettes, you know, people get used to it and you don't really know it's when you stop that you realize that you're addicted. And, and so if you can put that phone and computer away for 24 hours and it has no effect on you, um, you're probably not addicted. Um, if you're, anxious if you're you know and boredom is not a condition uh, of circumstance it's of choice you know so and or if you're bored or something you you really need to um say i got a problem with technology and i need to limit it um i i will tell you the worst piece of advice i've ever heard from one pastor to somebody <laughs> or, or I, it wasn't directly to them but they were talking um uh, about a person that was addicted to pornography. And this person was um, in a seminary and they had to go to an inpatient treatment. Uh, the woman was sent to an inpatient treatment center and she came back and, they, and then the, whoever was in overseeing her said, well, you know, we're trying to get them reintegrated with the computer in a healthy way. Jesus said, you know, take your eye out if you have to. There, there are some people that need to permanently disconnect. I have two uh, uh, friends. Uh, one I know is a billionaire and the other is probably real close if he's not. And both of them carry flip phones and they're billionaires. So you will survive. <laughs> um, and that's for people who are really having a problem, but there's a lot of people who are really having a problem with technology because you can commit uh, and break every one of the 10 commandments with a computer. Um, and, and so don't think of it just as a habit. Think of it as, you know, your portal to either sin or, or to something redeeming. Yeah, that's a good word. Thank you. AJ, do you have something else you want to ask? 
I think um, I think I've asked the questions I'd like to ask, but I'm obviously extraordinarily grateful for Matthew's Matthew's work here. Yeah, so am I. I want to just say I really love your book. I have it right here, twenty four six. Um, you have one of the things I really loved was your discussion in there about the value of time, and how much how how when we you know as as a Christ follower we have a different perspective of time and the shortness of life and how that can really help us cherish and value the time of Sabbath the time of rest and and recharging. Um, is there anything that you could say to speak to that? Well, I, I would I would say yes. I mean, we should have a very different perspective on time. But I think that one fault that we can make um, is is saying that, well, you know, I'm I'm on to the next life, or I'm I'm on to heaven, and and you know what what's happening here doesn't really matter. And so, the challenge theologically I would put to people is if if you believe in an all powerful God, and I do and you believe that that God wants to bring you into relationship, into a, a right relationship, and would do anything, including send his only son to die, to make sure that that happens, why weren't you just born in heaven in the first place? And what you will quickly come to is that this life and this earth and this time is a very precious gift. And it, it, it's not, it, it's, maybe it's a little thing, but if we're faithful in this little thing, we're given bigger things. And, and so um, I don't think we want to fritter our time away here. I think we want to redeem the hours and count the hours and, and to know that this life does end. It, 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 it uh, you know, the ride stops and there'll be judgment. And, and that sort of thing, we're playing with really big stakes <laughs> here. And, and, so, um, uh, uh, and, and so time is very, very valuable. Um, it's, it's more valuable than money or anything else. And, um, and we need to redeem it. Um, and you will, you know, to me, it's very interesting that in this COVID experience, some days it feels like it's going, time is going very slowly. And then wham, it's, you know, what happened to the last um, six months? Um, I think without Sabbath in my life over the last six months, it would have just disappeared. And, um, and, and so, uh, you know, time is something to think about. It's, uh, it's something that Jesus is constantly cautioning and warning people that time will run out. There will not be time to get any more oil for your lamp. Um, uh, the invitation will close, the door will close, um, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so redeem, redeem the hours now and, and uh, get about the work of uh, spreading the gospel and the kingdom. Yeah, I don't think any of us are going to get to the end of our life and say, I wish I would have worked harder. I wish I would yeah. have, you know, uh, spent more time in the office. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to say, I wish I would have enjoyed my life more, right? I wish yes. I would have clung to the Lord more closely and rested more and just savored each moment, right? My uh, granddaughter, you're getting sick of it, she came in. She, uh, I don't think she fell in the stream right by my house. She went in and came in the house and all excited and soaking wet and and she just hugged me and hugged me and those are those are the moments that count not uh not that work isn't important and everything um and they feel even more special as i can't go and hug all the people that i want to uh in this you know time of separation that we're going through yeah that's right aj anything else that you want to ask not, not on my end. Nope. Okay. And, and I would uh, just tell people for those uh, who want the book 24-6 and for some reason can't afford it, I don't know whether people in prison hear this, but I get notes from them. Uh, just Google Matthew Slate and it'll suck you to our website and I'll send you one if you That's can't awesome. afford it. 
Thank you so much for your generosity. Also, this um, time together, this webinar has been recorded. So if anybody uh, wants to view it again or pass it on to friends, um, you'll have an opportunity to do that. So um, I just want to say thank you so much, um, Matthew, for being here with us and for giving us such great things to think about. Uh, thank you, AJ, for being here and being a panelist. And we're just, we're just so grateful for our time together. So thank you. Um, yeah, have thank you. Thank you, Marianne, as well, for your work. Yeah, have a, have a great rest of your day. We look forward to reading more of your books, especially the new one on suicide that's coming out. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me.